Winston Churchill, a uh, very famous, obviously, in, uh, individual. Um, you may have seen pictures of him with FDR uh, back in World War II. Um, you know, he wasn't always in charge. Uh, however, he was a, a politician. He was a very famous author, um, tons and tons of books, um, a lot of histories and nonfiction type stuff, um, but uh, very good with the, with the language. Um, and uh, the piece we're going to read here is uh, it's the most famous speech that I've heard of his. Um, not being from Britain, I don't know if there are others, but this is the one that, that I know him by. Um, Be ye men of valor. This is his first public radio address to his people. Okay, and look at the year. Uh, it said 1940. May, yep, May 19th, 1940. A uh, World War II is going on. Put yourself in that position where they're at. The Nazis are spreading through Europe. They're getting a lot closer, and eventually they're going to hop over that little bit of water, that English Channel, and attack England and London. Okay, so he knows the war is coming. Everybody can see that that plague, that Nazi plague, spreading throughout Europe, and they're a little country. Yes, they have that empire, but realistically, they're really small, tiny, and they're isolated. Okay? Um, and so his job in this radio address is to, even though we have this impending doom coming, this dark storm on the horizon coming, okay, we must not waver. We must be strong. He does a wonderful job, and, and pay attention to the details, okay, where he's talking about numbers and all of these different things. Um, you know, would you be convinced if you were a British person, be like, yeah, yeah, let's get them. Because you were all in the same mindset of, oh, they're coming, they're coming, impending doom. Okay, impending doom is coming. Um, but look at how he, with his spoken word, he is able to uh, convey his, uh, uh, you know, the purpose of, you know, of unifying a, a troubled country. Um, and that's what uh, he does here. This is very famous, okay? And I mentioned this back when we talked in the Renaissance period. Uh, remember Elizabeth I, her speech at Tilbury? The Spanish Armada was getting ready to come, okay? And they did come, but the English Navy was able to defeat them, and they never landed. But remember what she was telling them. And they were the greatest naval force in the world, okay? The all-stars were coming to fight us on our own court. Okay, and, and she knew this. But remember, she walked amongst them and talked about how, you know, I've had this, you see a feeble, an old woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, not just any king, but a king of England, right? Okay, that was a, a famous speech. So we saw that, and that was, you know, uh, 15, late 1500s. Okay, but here we are in 1940. So we have a man who's in charge, not a king or queen, but the prime minister, so the real power, because you know the king and queen don't have power, more figureheads now. Um, and so we, now we have the, the leader of England, a man this time, but yet overwhelming odds against you, but yet the same kind of message. And we saw what kind of rallying cry was behind Elizabeth. Does he get, would you think he gets the same kind of rallying cry? Would you be motivated? to fight and, and die and do what needs to be done based on what he says. So pay attention to that. Uh be ye men of valor by Winston Churchill. BBC London, 19 May 1940. I speak to you for the first time as prime minister in a solemn hour for the life of our country, of our empire, of our allies, and above all of the cause of freedom. A tremendous battle is raging in France and Flanders. The Germans, by a remarkable combination of air bombing and heavily armored tanks, have broken through the French defenses north of the Maginot Line, and strong columns of their armored vehicles are ravaging the open country, which for the first day or two was without defenders. They have penetrated deeply and spread alarm and confusion in their track. Behind them there are now appearing infantry in lorries, and behind them again the large masses are moving forward. The regroupment of the French armies to make head against and also to strike at this intruding wedge has been proceeding for several days, largely assisted by the magnificent efforts of the Royal Air Force. 
We must not allow ourselves to be intimidated by the presence of these armored vehicles in unexpected places behind our lines. If they are behind our front, the French are also at many points fighting actively behind theirs. Both sides are therefore in an extremely dangerous position. And if the French army and our own army are well handled, as I believe they will be, if the French retain that genius for recovery and counterattack for which they have so long been famous, and if the British army shows the dogged endurance and solid fighting power of which there have been so many examples in the past, then a sudden transformation of the scene might spring into being. It would be foolish, however, to disguise the gravity of the hour. It would be still more foolish to lose heart and courage, or to suppose that well-trained, well-equipped armies, numbering three or four millions of men, can be overcome in the space of a few weeks or even months by a scoop or raid of mechanized vehicles, however formidable. We may look with confidence to the stabilization of the front in France, and to the general engagement of the masses, which will enable the qualities of the French and British soldiers to be matched squarely against those of their adversaries. For myself, I have invincible confidence in the French army and its leaders. Only a very small part of that splendid army has yet been heavily engaged, and only a very small part of France has yet been invaded. There is good evidence to show that practically the whole of the specialized and mechanized forces of the enemy have been already thrown into the battle, and we know that very heavy losses have been inflicted upon them. No officer or man, no brigade or division which grapples at close quarters with the enemy, wherever encountered, can fail to make a worthy contribution to the general result. The armies must cast away the idea of resisting behind concrete lines or natural obstacles, and must realize that mastery can only be regained by furious and unrelenting assault. And this spirit must not only animate the high command, but must inspire every fighting man. In the air, often at serious odds, often at odds hitherto thought overwhelming, we have been clawing down three or four to one of our enemies, and the relative balance of the British and German air forces is now considerably more favorable to us than at the beginning of the battle. In cutting down the German bombers, we are fighting our own battle as well as that of France. My confidence in our ability to fight it out to the finish with the German air force has been strengthened by the fierce encounters which have taken place and are taking place. At the same time, our heavy bombers are striking nightly at the taproot of German mechanized power, and have already inflicted serious damage upon the oil refineries on which the Nazi effort to dominate the world directly depends. We must expect that as soon as stability is reached on the Western Front, the bulk of that hideous apparatus of aggression which gashed Holland into ruin and slavery in a few days will be turned upon us. I am sure I speak for all when I say we are ready to face it, to endure it, and to retaliate against it, to any extent that the unwritten laws of war permit. There will be many men, and many women, in this island, who, when the ordeal comes upon them, as come it will, will feel comfort, and even a pride, that they are sharing the perils of our lads at the front, soldiers, sailors, and airmen, God bless them and are drawing away from them a part, at least, of the onslaught they have to bear. Is not this the appointed time for all to make the utmost exertions in their power? If the battle is to be won, we must provide our men with ever-increasing quantities of the weapons and ammunition they need. We must have, and have quickly, more airplanes, more tanks, more shells, more guns. There is imperious need for these vital munitions. They increase our strength against the powerfully armed enemy. They replace the wastage of the obstinate struggle, and the knowledge that wastage will speedily be replaced enables us to draw more readily upon our reserves and throw them in now that everything counts so much. Our task is not only to win the battle, but to win the war. After this battle in France abates its force, 
There will come the battle for our island, for all that Britain is and all that Britain means. That will be the struggle. In that supreme emergency, we shall not hesitate to take every step, even the most drastic, to call forth from our people the last ounce and the last inch of effort of which they are capable. The interests of property, the hours of labor, are nothing compared with the struggle for life and honor, for right and freedom, to which we have vowed ourselves. I have received from the chiefs of the French Republic and in particular from its indomitable Prime Minister, Monsieur Renault, the most sacred pledges, that whatever happens they will fight to the end, be it bitter or be it glorious. Nay, if we fight to the end it can only be glorious. Having received His Majesty's commission, I have found an administration of men and women of every party and of almost every point of view. We have differed and quarreled in the past, but now one bond unites us all, to wage war until victory is won, and never to surrender ourselves to servitude and shame, whatever the cost and the agony may be. This is one of the most awe-striking periods in the long history of France and Britain. It is also beyond doubt the most sublime. Side by side, unaided except by their kith and kin in the great dominions and by the wide empires which rest beneath their shield, side by side the British and French peoples have advanced to rescue not only Europe but mankind from the foulest and most soul-destroying tyranny which has ever darkened and stained the pages of history. Behind them, behind us, behind the armies and fleets of Britain and France, gather a group of shattered states and bludgeoned races, the Czechs, the Poles, the Norwegians, the Danes, the Dutch, the Belgians, upon all of whom the long night of barbarism will descend, unbroken even by a star of hope. Unless we conquer, as conquer we must, as conquer we shall. Today is Trinity Sunday. Centuries ago, words were written to be a call and a spur to the faithful servants of truth and justice. Arm yourselves, and be ye men of valor, and be in readiness for the conflict, for it is better for us to perish in battle than to look upon the outrage of our nation and our altar. As the will of God is in heaven, even so let it be. It is better for us to perish in battle than to look upon the outrage of our nation and our altar as the will of God is in heaven. Even so, let it be. That's not the first reference to God that he has throughout here. Um, you know, referring to our, our fighting men and such. Oh, God bless them. God bless them. And, you know, still showing admiration and support uh, for those individuals, even if, um, you know, uh, you know they're, they're struggling and, and dying on, on the front. Um, I speak to you for the first time as Prime Minister. I mean, that's, that's the key thing that's just as hard to believe that some, just, you thought your job, you know, you have to take over for somebody's other position. But here, you're, you're taking over a country, and a country that is in war, and now you have to address everybody. And this is the first time that, that they are hearing him in his capacity as uh, Prime Minister. And it is a solemn hour for the life of our country, of our empire, of our alleys, and above all, of the cause of freedom. So he just lists him. He even talks about how they overran Holland and Belgium, and you know, within days, you know, they took over the Nazis and such. And when they turn their attention to us, because they will turn their attention to us, it's inevitable. So he's coming straight out and saying that this is going to happen. Just ignoring it isn't going to help. We need to do something. We need to unite and get all of our resources and everybody firing on the same cylinders. Um, page 1169 at the top, they're talking about the French. The French, uh, remember um, Britain's engagement is really along the northern area of France. Um, and so the French are you know, struggling and, and fighting and such. And you're, for the most part, they're losing. And if the French army and our army so he's starting to come up with, you know, what ifs, if they can fight and if they can be victorious because, you know, history shows that they have done it before, so why wouldn't they? 
positive thinking, positive thinking. Um, and if the French army and our army are well handled, as I believe they will be, if the French retain the genius for recovery and counterattack for which they have so long been famous, and if the British army shows the dogged endurance and solid fighting power of which there have been so many examples, we should be pretty good. So not only is he pumping up the French about their counterattacks, you know, they're on the ropes, but they come back fighting and swinging. Not only are they famous for that, but us, if we can do what we've done before, not just once or twice, but countless examples. I'm not even going to go into the examples because there's so many. So if we just do what historically we've done, we're going to be okay. We're still going to fight and have some death, but we still, um, you know, we still have uh, a lot of opportunity. For myself, down towards the bottom, I have invincible confidence in the French army and its leaders. Only a very small part of that splendid army has yet been heavily engaged. So yes, they are getting beaten, but I have invincible confidence in them because only a small portion has actually joined the fight of the French army, is what he's saying. And I have it on good, good, good evidence to show that practically the whole of the specialized and mechanized forces of the enemy have been already thrown into the battle and we know that very heavy losses have been inflicted upon them. So the French have only you know, put in a small amount, maybe 20%, I'm throwing this out there, 20, 25% of the resources, and they're, they're getting pounded. But we also know that the Nazis are all in. They don't have any chips back to play with. The French still have some gambling to go. These guys, everything is there, and they're starting to take hits and heavy losses, and there's no replenishing. There's no substitutions. They're, go, they're in there for the duration until the clock runs out. Okay? Um, and so he says, the French guys here, I'm British, I know we're British, but our French, the, our allies, they are only have engaged 25, maybe half. They probably still have a lot in reserve. And look at the damage that they've caused. On um, the next page, um, in the air, we have been clawing down three or four to one of our enemies. So for every one that we die and lose, we take down three or four. Well, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah. But what, you know, if you look belie below that, the subtext, that's great if we start with an even number. Right? If we have a million Nazis versus a hundred British, you can take down four, you can take down a thousand apiece. But eventually, that million is going to hold out over, over that hundred. Actually, that might be just about right. But do you see the whole point of that? But yet, the people that are fighting are doing a great job. We should be very proud of them. We're taking down three or four enemies for every one that gets us. That's great. We need to keep fighting and keep doing that and keep doing better. Because we are in that, uh, you know, exacting revenge on them and so on. Um, Talking about their bombers down there at the bottom. The fierce encounters which have taken place and are taking place. Uh, at the same time, our heavy bombers are striking nightly at the taproot of German mechanized power and have already inflicted serious damage upon the oil refineries. They need that oil. They need that gas for all of their tanks, all of their planes, all of that mechanized machines that they're using to hold their power and accrue more power. And we are cutting off those supplies nightly, bombing nightly. And so we are hitting them. And we are hurting them. And so be positive about that. We're not just sitting back waiting for them to come get us. We go and get them. Um, yeah, that bulk of that hideous apparatus of aggression which gassed ho gashed Holland into ruins and slavery in a few days, it will be turned upon us, I am sure. I speak for all when I say we are ready to face it, to endure it, to retaliate against it. There will be many men and many women in this island who when the ordeal comes upon them, as come it will. So again, this is like the third or fourth time. It's coming, folks. This war is coming, but we're not just going to hide by it. We're going to welcome it and fight it and retaliate, and we're going to endure it and ultimately be victorious. Um, you know, that there will be people here, men and women, who will feel comfort and even pride that they are drawing away from them a part, at least, of the onslaught they have to bear. 
they're prideful that all of these bombs you're dropping on us here in England, where aren't they dropping the bombs at? On their troops fighting in France. All these bullets you're wasting on us, they're bullets that are being spent and not being shot at our boys in bunkers all around France. And we're prideful of that. Because I am a frail woman, and I, you know, 80-year-old woman, 60, 50, 40-year-old woman, and I'm not going to pick up a gun and fight, but I can contribute here, just like we did, ladies, in America during World War II. You've heard of Rosie the Riveter, right? They had that bit poster, the cartoon lady with the bandana going like this. You know, they were in the factories riveting, you know, submarines and putting together airplanes and all these things while the men were away. The women really probably fought that war by providing all of that stuff. Um, and so he's saying the re relatively the same thing, that we will provide them. They need planes. They need weapons. They need all these things, and we will make it for them, and we will be prideful of that. And everything that comes face to us, all of the attention that they're drawing to us is not being focused on them. It's like in uh, the Lord of the Rings movies. The tower, Sauron's tower, that big eye in Mordor, right, that's always looking around for him, looking around. Well, Frodo and Sam are there at the base of the volcano, Mount Doom, to throw the thing, but they can't get, they can't cross to get to Mount Doom because of all the orcs. And so Aragon and all his friends go out to the gate, and they go, hey, come and get us, come and fight us. So they emptied out all the orcs. It was a distraction. They were, they were ready to die. Sheer numbers, they were, they were toast. Toast, and that's what makes it so heroic that Aragon just charges them, and even the little hobbits go and charge the fight they're running to certain death, for the most part, if Frodo doesn't get up there and do, do what he does, you know, with Sam and such. But the whole point is the moment that all that attention happens, that eye goes over to that attention, and so Frodo can skip around, you know, with Sam up to the mountain. Well, it's not really skipping, but you get my point. And get up to the mountain and, and drop the ring in. They were pleased. They knew that this war was coming, and they welcomed it because every enemy that was focused on them was not focused on Frodo and the main objective. The main objective is not win the battle, but win the war. Okay? So anything that can be drawn to us will, you know, Frodo and Sam and can win the war. And that's ultimately what we want. That's ultimately what happens. Spoiler alert. Um, so more airplanes, more tanks, all of these things. Um, you know, the knowledge on the last page. They need to have the knowledge that wasting will spe speedily be replaced and enables us to, you know, to draw more. So when they're shooting, if they're like, oh my gosh, this is my last clip, I'm out of ammo, they know that there's more ammo coming, and hopefully soon. It's not like, okay, well, I'm out of bullets, throwing rocks at them now. That won't work too well with tanks. Bullets probably didn't work well with tanks either. Um, but we have to provide our boys, our service people with that um, that sense of, uh, of pride and of support. Um, so really a great rallying cry. Okay, he even says that this is one of the most awe-striking periods in the long history of France and Britain. If you've seen the movie Apollo 13, they're going to the moon, and there's a big accident happening out there, and it's a, it's a tragedy and all of these things, and you see in Mission Control, and these people are like, oh, this is the, you know, this is the, the most traumatic, the, the worst possible day in history, and, and this flight director turns out and goes, no. I think this is one of our finest moments. Think about that. Can you see how Churchill is saying here that this is one of the great moments of history, folks? You are lucky to be a part of this history. Bully for you. Good job. L let's go and make history. So, a good pep talk? Yeah. Knowing certain death is coming through, you know, coming, war and all of this thing, and everybody's petrified and scared, and now you have a leader who comes out in his first opportunity and tells you all these things, don't you want to just lace them up and go and, and do what you need to do? Maybe not go on the front lines, but maybe run to the factory and help with the construction. Okay? So, I mean, it's just a wonderful, wonderful uh, rhetoric, use of the words. Um, compare it and contrast it to what Elizabeth said in her speech to Tilbury. Okay, remember she got them riled up, he got these guys riled up, now he's not standing amongst them all along the water, you know, talking to them. So it's a bit different, but yet, through the radio, these people are hearing it, and his country is, is becoming unified, more so than it ever was before um, during this time period. Okay?